Thank you for joining us today. My name is Nida Zawahre. I am a professor at Cleveland State University and a member of the Northeast Ohio Consortium for Middle Eastern Studies. Today we have Professor Shireen Hafez of the University of California at Riverside. Um, she will be our second speaker in the series. Welcome, Professor Hafez. Uh, welcome, Nida. Thank you so much for inviting me. What do you think are some of the misconceptions Americans have about Muslim women? Well, I think that one of the most common mis misperceptions is the idea that Muslim women are in general oppressed. And uh, that is actually one of the main impressions anyone who lives in the Western world uh, seems to have of Muslim women. I mean, all you have to do is just Google Muslim women and look at Google images. And I always ask my students to do this. And basically, all the images that you get online uh, are of women whose faces are covered and uh, swathed in black. And some of the pictures show women who are crying or women who are behind bars. Uh, you only need to do this to see what the world thinks of Muslim women, you know, what the Western world thinks of Muslim women. Uh, so that perhaps, you know, more than anything else is one of the main images that come to mind in the Western world of Muslim women. And that's what we try in our work um, to address, because I think that it's very important to see that um, women in the Muslim world are very diverse, that uh, indeed there are oppressed women all over the world. Uh, and so there are also oppressed women in the Muslim world. This does not mean that oppression does not exist. It does, of course. But uh, the majority of women in the Muslim world are by no means oppressed or behind bars or swathed in black and covered faces. Um, in your field research, I, I read some of your articles and I, I was fascinated by your work. Um, you spent quite a time um, understanding these organizations. Can you give us some examples of um, cases that shocked you, that you were just absolutely surprised that what you guys are doing is actually liberalizing women in this conservative discourse, but women are being empowered. Yeah, I, I think um, there are many stories to tell. I mean, the, you know, my, my book is uh, an Islam of her own uh, that just came out. There are plenty of stories and basically I have uh, five or six case studies of women whom I've known extremely closely. Uh, who have told me their stories, and, and I was very impressed to know them, and I was very privileged to know them, actually. Uh, so many of these women, you know, talk to me about how they started to engage with Islam, for example. Uh, and they almost always, many of them say, oh, you know, I was not religious at all. You know, I was never religious. Uh, one of them uh, went so far as to say, you know, I wore bikinis and went to the beach and, and, and got suntan on the beach. You know, I really never thought about, you know, modesty or religion or any of that stuff. Uh, so a lot of them really don't start from even religious backgrounds. They, um, almost all of them said that they were inspired either by a figure that they met, a neighbor perhaps, or maybe uh, someone, you know, like a teacher, one of, one of the very, um, one of the leaders of the organization was telling me that she had a teacher that, that she looked up to who was extremely inspirational and showed her that she can actually uh, be very strong uh, even though she is religious and pious and, and so on and so forth. And so many of these women look to other women for inspiration. Uh, they're inspired by even TV. One of them was telling me that she was watching um, an old movie about a religious figure uh, in, in Islamic history and she was so taken by this figure that she had to go and research her and when she found out the history and and the the struggle that uh, these early Muslim women went through she was so inspired that she decided to you know delve deeper into her religion and find out more about it. Uh, suffice it to say I mean in Egypt many women you know go through uh, school education and university education without really having a chance to learn about Islam. Um, the, many of the curricula in Egypt are actually, you know, uh, were actually put in place uh, after the 1952 revolution. And as you know, the 1952 revolution was the start of nationalism in Egypt, the nation state building. And the emphasis on religion was actually 
removed from the syllabi. And um, even though religion was still taught at schools, but it was a very, you know, sort of rudimentary, superficial kind of stories from, um, you know, Islamic history, a few verses of Quran here and there, but there was not really much depth to uh, these topics. So many women feel very disempowered because they don't know their rights in Islam. And they don't know how Islam uh, views women. Uh, and they don't read about, you know, how to understand gender relations in Islam, for example. So when these women start learning about Islam, and this is what they do, they go to the halakat, which are, you know, like circles of uh, study, and they start learning about uh, their, their religion and how it honors them and how uh, it values them. Uh, they start realizing that, you know, they've missed out. And they try to compensate for that by learning more and, and understanding more about, you know, the place of women in Islam. And many of the women that I have spoken to actually tell me uh, that they are very proud to be Muslim because of the uh, advantages that they gain in Islam and how Islam, you know, really values women and so on. Uh, so this is not a story, I'm sorry, <laughs> but, but some of the stories uh, that come to mind, for example, are two women that I talk about in uh, one of my articles and also one of the, my, the chapters of the book in uh, Women Developing Women. And, and these women basically went to the American University as undergraduates, uh, one of them did. And um, they were, again, you know, very uh, westernized, upper middle class Egyptians. They had, uh, you know, some activities that were involved in, you know, social welfare and so on, helping people, that is. But they never really felt that they belonged in these organizations that were entirely secular. They felt sort of... Um, out of touch with people, they felt that they were basic, these organizations basically focused on the rich and the wealthy, you know, th things, organizations like uh, Inner Wheel, you know, uh, the Rotary Act and so on and so, uh, so forth. So they decided to, uh, this, you know, investigate what other organizations exist that may be a little bit more authentic. And when they joined this organization that I call Al Hilal in my book, um, they they found themselves really drawn to the organization, really drawn to other women because they felt that they were very genuine, uh, that they were very welcome. Even though they were, they they told me that at the beginning when they joined these org this organization, they were not even veiled, and yet they were extremely welcome among the women there, and they were not even. And this was an experience actually that I had as well. I mean, when I went. Uh, when I spent a lot of time with them, I never once had someone come up to me and say, well, why don't you consider wearing a veil, for example? Uh, I never once had anyone come up to me and criticize the way I dressed or um, the fact that my hair was uncovered. Uh, so they, basically, these women's organizations are very welcoming. So um, these two women that I, I'm, I'm talking about in the book, you know, they went to a village in Middle Egypt. And I've been to that village with them several times. And... I was really astounded at, you know, the level of poverty there. Even as an Egyptian myself, I was not really, um, you know, experienced in knowing, uh, you know, Middle Egypt that much. You know, basically most of my travels were in North Egypt and in Upper Egypt where, you know, there there's basically a lot of emphasis on tourism and so on. Middle Egypt is usually left uh, to fend for itself. And so the levels of poverty there are extremely high. Uh, so, you know, I remember riding in this, you know, taxi, you know, the, the, the five-person taxi, you know, very common in, in Egypt. This is one of the, the very common ways of traveling to uh, Middle Egypt and the Said, Upper Egypt, and being crammed up in the car with lots of stuff around us, and, and then, you know, going through the bumpy roads and, um, you know, the, the Egyptian countryside, and then finally landing in this village in nowhere. And all of a sudden, from everywhere, there were throngs of people, young girls, you know, older women. Uh, everybody was sort of waiting, you know, expectantly for these women to show up. And, and they all came and they, they took the stuff from, they unpacked the vehicle, you know, which was, you know, full of, of uh, stuff that was going to be used, you know, for arts and crafts and, and projects like that. And then we went up to the building and, and it was just I could feel the enthusiasm, I could feel the impact that these, just two women, two young women, you know, working in this village with over 200, 300 people, and yet their impact was so strong, and their welcome was so warm and incredibly joyous. Um, it was just a, an incredible experience, just to see that particular moment, the moment of their arrival in the village. 
and I was for a second, you know, really taken for by by the effort, you know, that they would actually travel this far, uh, make make a point to connect with these people, make a point to establish an organization that helps promote, you know, jobs and helps promote independence for women and helps promote. Um, a, a better lifestyle for them and for their children. Um, th this was something that you know really touched me at the time. Which, which also, I mean, I have to say, you know, as an anthropologist, you're also torn between being very impressed with uh, what you know the people you're studying are doing, but also at the same time, you ha you need to be very, you know, you need to put yourself in a position where you're not making judgments and you're not affected by these, you know, incredibly, you know, obviously joyous moments. So um, that's what I problematize in the book, you know, the kind of Islamic development that is happening in the villages and how we need to actually be more critical about uh, where that kind of development is going. Um, in your talk at the City Club uh, Forum at Westfield Theatre, you're going to focus more specifically on the role of women in the Egyptian uprising. Um, what about those roles that it's new and were you able to be in Egypt during this time and observe it or were you like the rest of us watching it on television? <laughs> Unfortunately, I was just like the rest of you. I was really, I was really torn, you know, and I, I, um, it was, uh, it was Christmas break. And this was a time when I was, you know, like the rest of us, you know, going to work on a lot of delayed projects. And um, and then I, I watched the news one night and I could not believe my eyes. You know, I, I just could not believe my eyes what was happening there. I remember I was giving a talk uh, on the 22nd of January um, here in Pomona College. And, you know, the audience were very interested to know what I thought of what's going to happen to the uprising and was it, was it going to be uh, indeed successful. And being an Egyptian and having lived under Mubarak's rule most of my life, uh, I could not see a bright future ahead. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think I said something like, uh, well, we're going to have to wait and see, you know, Mubarak's rule has been so long for so, you know, has been, you know, in, in Egypt for so long that it's very hard for me to actually envision that uh, reign ending. So it was almost like the movement or the uprising was somehow doomed by people who were pessimistic, who did not think that this could happen. You know, there was this myth of longevity, I guess, or this myth of um, of, of the ruler, you know, that, that nothing could face him, nothing could move him from, from the government. And the fact that these people actually went out there and had that hope and had that incredible zest and passion for uh, removing Mubarak from uh, his seat, from unseating him, uh, just changed my whole perception on myself and, and, and the Middle East and the Arab world, you know, incredibly, because it was totally unexpected. And uh, yeah, I was here watching watching uh, the TV on the, my computer, uh, Skyping with family and, you know, talking on the phone. And it was just an incredible, even, even seeing it from here was an incredible moment. But then I started to get a lot of requests to give talks about the uprising. And I realized that although, you know, I would really love to go there and be in Egypt, that my place is here, that I need to be, again, you know, continuing to raise awareness about the plight of uh, people in the Middle East and, you know, the kind of despotic governments that they have to labor under. And I felt like, you know, well, I'm in the right time, in the right place, and I need to do my job. So I stayed here. Yes, I remember the images that were, we were seeing of women and men in the streets holding the signs saying, you know, Mubarak out, Irhal. Um, and it, it was it was quite surprising to see for many people that women were actually in the streets trying for, pushing for regime change, wanting to a more democratic system, wanting a voice in the system. Um, what, what were your observations? Well, um, the statistics say, aside from my observations, that women comprised about 20 to 50 percent of the demonstrators uh, at different times. Uh, it's, it's very clear, and, and history will record this, that one of the main you know, motivators or instigators for the uprising was a woman, a young woman, who was 20 years old. Her name is Asma Mahfouz, and I will actually be talking about her uh, when I come to Cleveland. 
Uh, and Asma was did the unthinkable. She um, used her own femininity and her vulnerability as a woman in a society that is essentially patriarchal to call attention to the importance of being out there in Tahrir and saying, you know, I'm a young woman uh, and I actually am only 20 years old, yet I'm going to be in Tahrir. And uh, if you are a man, she was talking to a male audience, if you are a man, you need to show up and protect me. And uh, by obligating men, you know, and basically pointing out to uh, a lack of masculinity on their part if they don't show up, I think Asma Mahfouz, you know, was able to rally a huge amount of support uh, for the uh, uprising in January, on January 20, 21st. Yes, I, I um, remember seeing both women that were covered and women that were quite westernized and open and liberal and with their beautiful single Chanel sunglasses, right? All dressed up, um, very much from the upper class of Egyptian societies in the streets. So I wonder what your observations were in seeing this dichotomy. It's as if it was almost every single segment of society was out there. Absolutely. And uh, this is what made the uprising so successful and continues to make the uprising successful, or the revolution uh, successful, is the fact that it draws upon every walk of life in Egypt. Uh, not just, you know, different classes, but also different religions, uh, different uh, ethnic groups, different, even people from different governorates have flocked down to Tahrir, you know, even though they've had, you know, of course, local uprisings, but they've also come down to Tahrir and set up tents in Tahrir uh, to be part of the uh, uprising. One of, one of the stories that uh, came down to me, actually, because through the telephone, <laughs> As I was speaking to uh, some, you know, friends of mine and, and people that I've worked with in, in Egypt, and they were telling me, well, this woman was telling me, uh, she spent the night in Tahrir. And uh, she said that uh, she had no idea that she was going to do that, that uh, she was totally unprepared, uh, but that uh, they got swept away, you know, with, with the whole fervor of it. You know, everybody was like, we're not going to leave until he leaves. And so they were unprepared. And she said that um, they, they were surprised because uh, some young men from the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, w you know, who were obviously dressed in Islamic, you know, Islamically with, you know, they usually have, you know, longer beards and they wear, um, you know, sort of conservative Western dress. No, they, don't, they don't all wear, actually, the, the long galabe. And um, they organized them. They, they went up to the crowds of people in Tahrir and put them in rows, organized the camps. Uh, I'm sure you've been reading in the papers, for example, that um, the, the Tahrir Square was divided into different quarters. So there was uh, one side was, you know, dedicated to the use of Internet and computers, and they brought electricity to charge batteries and charge phones. Uh, one area was for recycling and trash, one area was for medical services, another area for sleeping, and so on and so forth. Uh, there was even a nursery uh, in one of the corners of Tahrir. So these organizations, this, this young woman who was talking to me, you know, she said, we were very surprised because these young men, you know, from the Muslim Brotherhood, we've never had any conversations with Muslim brothers before. And, you know, and yet here they were, you know, they, they really cared about our welfare. They really cared about what happened to us and they helped us and organized us. And if it weren't for them, um, the outcome of the uprising would have been very different. So that also was an important fact, the fact that, you know, even the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, an, an Islamic organization that has its own ideals and principles, was willing to, to work with everyone, you know, every single uh, individual, women, uh, men, young children of all kinds of religions and, and, and different, you know, um, obviously political and religious inclinations, yet they were willing to put that aside. And this spirit actually continues to this day, uh, with the exception, of course, of unfortunate occurrences that happened uh, in front of the TV building, um, you know, uh, about 27 Coptic Christians were massacred uh, as a result of uh, a confrontation between uh, the Coptic community and uh, the army. And this was extremely, extremely saddening to all of us, even here and, and in back in Egypt. This was totally unaccepted. And, um, and the next day, uh, the groups that came out were, again, all walks of life, Muslims, Christians together. Uh, holding the cross and the Bible, 
and it was really beautiful to hear about the incredible bonds that were be, uh, that were forged between Egyptians over this incident. Do you think it will change? It will empower women having participated in the revolution. Um, do you think it will empower them in society? Empower them in the government? Um, perhaps having more participation in the leadership in political parties? Well, uh, yes and no, and this is actually uh, one of the issues that now uh, I'm actually working on right now. Uh, the issue that, that women were so prominent in the revolution, um, women who have reported sexual harassment on the streets were saying that it was perfectly safe to be, tahrir, to be in Tahrir, 92% of women are, for example, harassed on, on the streets in Egypt, sexually harassed by, uh, by males, young males in particular, yet during the uprising there were no incidences reported and women, you know, reported that they were extremely safe and felt, you know, extremely well taken care of. Yet, um, unfortunately, after the, the first few days of the revolution, we started to see, you know, this kind of behavior, anti-women again, you know, starting to emerge on Women's International Day. A group of women went to Tahrir uh, to, to, you know, sort of, they were not basically calling for feminist rights. Uh, they were basically calling for, you know, a consideration of women's rights. And they were, um, they were supporting the, the revolution and they said that we're not here as women, we're here as Egyptians and we're here to remind everyone that we played a role in the revolution and so on. And uh, they were basically attacked by a group of men who um, purportedly claimed that they were an Islamist group, which I doubt very much, uh, because they harassed these women in, in quite indecent ways. And, um, and that was the beginning of the confrontation. Uh, many of the decision-making processes that took place uh, post-uprising did not include women, as in re rewriting the constitutional referendum, for example, no women was allowed. Uh, the uh, Supreme uh, the um, SCAF, Supreme Pounce, uh, Council for Army Forces, for Armed Forces in Egypt, who are in control right now, have basically um, uh, eliminated women from parliament, which, you know, Mubarak had reinstated women in parliament as per a particular quota. Uh, SCAF actually removed that, that quota again. Uh, women were uh, not allowed to run for govern uh, were not allowed to be elected as governors they were in the past uh, so we see uh, some reversal in women's rights and women's participation in uh, the political scene yet at the on the other hand as you mentioned you know because of women's empowerment during the uprising and the fact that women were so effective in fact without women you know this uprising could not have happened uh, but because they felt that uh, power that they gained by being out on Tahrir, at Tahrir and in different governorates, uh, women are resisting this elimination. They're resisting this marginalization. And they're out there. In fact, uh, Busaina Kamel is um, uh, now running for president. She is a young woman who works at, uh, who worked as a journalist, a reporter on TV. And she was, um, you know, actually directing a lot of programs that were pointing to corruption in the government and so on. And so she, she, she resigned in order to run for president. And one of, the, uh, one of her goals is to just be on the political scene. You know, she says, you know, obviously, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have much hope of winning. But just by being there, I'm changing people's perception about women as leaders. Um, other women like Tahani Gebeli, for example, who is uh, the only woman on the Supreme Council for Constitutional Reform, is uh, very outspoken, yet she doesn't really represent women. She says that women should represent themselves, and in fact, um, women should start performing their rights and sh they should not wait to be invited. Uh, so in other words, you know, she just wants women to do politics and not wait for men to say, well, please, can you come to parliament and please, can you be a governor? Uh, she wants women to actually go there and, and be the governor and be that politician. So, yes, women are, you know, it's a mixed bag, you know, despite the fact that they have been such an important part of the uprising, they have um, been marginalized by various political uh, groups. And also, we, there's a rise in, in religious groups right now, in re religious conservatism uh, with Salafi groups. And the Salafi groups are basically groups that... Um, that try to emulate the, th the first three generations of Muslims uh, after the Prophet Muhammad. 
Uh, and of course, this is their version of history and their version of how to perform Islamic uh, practices. And so the Salafis have actually met with SCAF uh, several times and have uh, presented them with signed petitions asking them to revoke any rights that women have gained under Mubarak. Uh, so there is definitely a backlash against women in the country that's uh, very pronounced right now. And women have to do a lot of work in order to counteract that. Okay, I look forward to you coming to Cleveland and I encourage everyone to join us and in the two series in the two lectures i look forward to coming too and uh, i'm very excited about this you know i've been you know really looking forward very eagerly especially since the uprising because like i said you know i feel it's my duty to talk about uh, what's happening in the middle east right now it's 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 quite an important you know point in history and i think everybody should know about it so thank you for inviting me